Lord, we thank you for your love and for your faithfulness, Lord. And we just uh, look to you now to bring your word alive and to bring life to each one of us, Father, that we could just be fulfilling the, your will in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a continuing on in our series, Being a Spiritually Minded Christian. This is part 12. And as you know, that's because last week was part 11. And we're going to continue on the theme called Surrendering to the Will of God in Prayer. Surrendering to the Will of God in Prayer. And I just want to do a little bit of a synopsis of what we've done. As believers, we have a choice. We can be naturally minded, we can be spirit, carnally minded, or we can be spiritually minded. And the three that areas that enable us to develop into spiritually minded Christians are our relationship to the Word of God, prayer, and Christian fellowship. We spent a number of weeks studying how to become spiritually minded Christians in relationship to the Word of God. Three weeks ago, we began studying how to become spiritually minded Christians through our relationship with God in prayer, and we looked at the delight of prayer. And if prayer is not a delight yet, we, we need to learn how to make it a delight. Two weeks ago, we looked at the supernatural aspect of prayer in terms of speaking in tongues and how it assists us in becoming spiritually minded. And last week, we answered the question, why do we pray? We looked at the purpose of prayer and why it is necessary to actually ask God to intervene in our lives, although he already knows our needs and already wants to help us and meet us, meet our needs because he loves us. We saw that the key to answering the question of why we need to pray was found in the creation narrative and the authority that God gave to man when he created the earth. Then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We learned that when God said, let them have dominion over all all the earth. It meant he gave man authority over all the earth. Therefore, authority over the earth does not lie with God or Satan, but with man, and there is ne- that has never changed. Our choices still matter. We also learned that there is a clear distinction and difference between authority and ability, or the power to actually do something. Although God gave man authority over the earth, it does not mean that God created man with the freedom or ability to carry out all that he wishes. Man is a limited, created being meant to rely on God's power and strength and the leading of the Holy Spirit. There is a distinction between authority and ability. Authority means one has the freedom to choose what one wants to do. Ability means one has the strength power, and resources to carry one's, out one's choices. I gave last week the example of you could own a piece of land, but you may not have the resource to actually build something on it. But you have the authority to choose who will build on your land. And so that's what it is. God has given us the authority to choose who's going to build into our lives. And on this earth, Therefore, God did not give man the power to do whatever he wanted. He gave him dominion over all the earth, so he has the authority to choose whose power and plans will be manifest in his life and on the earth. The entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is a story about the choices people made and how those choices shaped their lives. Some chose to submit to the will of God, while others chose to act contrary to his will. The Bible is filled with examples of the consequences of those who chose, whose choices opposed God's will and the blessings received by those who chose to submit to God's will. The first choice made by man, which is recorded in the Bible, is in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve were confronted by the serpent. They had to choose whom they would believe and whose words they would act upon, God's word or Satan's word. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve chose to agree with Satan's word and gave him building rights to establish his kingdom on this earth. Without Adam's choice to believe and act upon Satan's words, Satan would have been powerless to do anything upon the earth. 
we can see the importance of agreement and how one choice can change the course of history for mankind with devastating consequences. Every day, even as believers, we are confronted with the choice to whom to believe, either God and his word or the lies that fill this world. In a similar fashion, Joshua challenged Israel, choose for yourself this day whom will you serve? Prayer is one of the central ways in which we come into agreement with the will of God. Before we embark in any course of action, the first thing we should do is submit our will to God's will and come to him in prayer and ask him for guidance and blessing. Jesus is our good shepherd, and if invited to, he will lead us. If invited to, he will lead us. To experience the power of prayer in our lives, we must clearly con- clear, make clear, consistent decisions to yield to God and agree with him in prayer. Sometimes people say, oh God, just show me what you want to do and I'll follow you. But then later, we don't pray that constantly, and so we then take back what we said and go another way. In 1 John 5.14, it says this. Now this is the confidence that we have, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When our prayers line up with God's will, then we will see God's will released in our lives and those around us. I'm going to say this. Our prayers on their own are powerless. Our prayers on their own are powerless. It is important to understand that it is not our prayers that have the power to change things, but it is God who changes things when our prayers line up with his word and his will. So if we pray something contrary to God's will, your prayers are powerless. Because our prayers don't change things, God changes things when we ask. When our prayers are motivated by fleshly desires or selfishness, they are powerless. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. When we pray according to God's will, our prayers will be like well-placed arrows hitting their intended target. They will bring forth eternal results. You know, when we know the God's will and we begin to pray, it's like arrows hitting the target and producing eternal fruitful results. If we do not come into agreement with God's will in prayer, we will not see God's will done in our lives. Some Christians don't know God's will, and others fail to pray into God's will, even when it's revealed to them. And that's why when God gives us visions or prophetic words specifically for our lives, it's not like that was interesting. If we don't pray into those things, we won't see the fulfillment. We won't see the fulfillment, but if we say, this is what you said, Lord, I'm going to begin to pray in agreement with what you've spoken over my life. If you continue to do that, you will see God's will fulfilled in your life. Some Christians speak about freedom, but fail to agree with God in prayer until that freedom is fully manifest. You know, sometimes Christians, they they come and they say, okay, God, I want to be free from this bad habit. I want to be free from this negative way of thinking or whatever it is. That's a good prayer, but continue to pray that until God fulfills that in your life fully. In other words, don't pray it once and say, yeah, that was good. I prayed, but nothing happened. You pray every day and knowing that God is hearing you and God is working in your life. Every revival recorded in the Bible or in the history of the church was birthed through people waiting on God and continuing to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, until it was fulfilled. If you study church history, there's not one revival, not one revival that did not occur without prayer. Without people, not praying just once, but but earnestly, sometimes weeks, months, sometimes years, sometimes decades. You know, there were two great awakenings in America, one in the 1700s, one in the 1800s. And at that point, America was on such a low spiritual level. It was horrible. But people were praying, and that revival came, those two great awakenings, and transformed the United States of America spiritually. And so we need to be praying also that God will still move. And in Acts 1.14, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. On the day of Pentecost, the church was born. 
Subsequently, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the first revival meeting in the church was held. Each of these events was birthed through prayer. Jesus' disciples spent 10 days in prayer, waiting in the upper room for the promise of the fa- from the Father. In other words, after he didn't say, well, I'm going to pour out my spirit, so just wait, wait around. He says, wait in Jerusalem. In other words, be watchful and wait. In other words, what happens if they didn't wait? What happens if they didn't pray and seek God? There are many churches that God wants to move in. But the people are not seeking God in prayer until they see the fulfillment of God's will in that local fellowship or in that, in that city or in their nation or in the nations. From Genesis 22, we studied the significance of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac as a whole offering. When Abraham took Isaac his only son by his wife Sarah, and offered him up on Mount Moriah as a whole offering unto God, this was not only an act of faith and obedience, it was truly an act of worship and prayer before God. Anyone brought a sacrifice to the temple, it wasn't like, here it is, it's he brought it and it was slain and he gave it as an act of worship and prayer. This sacrifice is yours. To fully comprehend the significance of what Abraham did, we must understand that God did not say, just say, because you have had faith in me, all the nations of the shall be blessed. But because you've done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son, it wasn't just because he had faith and obedience, it's because of what specifically he did. God specifically says, give up your son as a whole offering to me. And he said, and he did, and that says, because you've done this and not withheld your son, your only son, all the nations of the world will be blessed. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you obeyed my voice. Abraham, in his act of worship and prayer, gave up not only his son Isaac, but dedicated all his descendants to the will of God which ultimately resulted in the birth of God's son Jesus in the lineage of Abraham to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Through Abraham's obedience, Jesus was able to come as the Son of Man to redeem mankind. The person referred to by God as, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, is not Isaac, but Jesus, just as Paul stated in Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, as to your seed, who is Christ. So you have to understand that when, when Abraham did that, he offered up not only Isaac, but all his descendants. So God then, by Abraham's authority, by giving up his descendants, God then could use that to bring forth his son to be that sacrifice. Unless Abraham had agreed with God's will, Jesus could not have come into the world as a son of man through the offspring of Abraham. God would have had to find another person who would believe and agree with him to surrender his descendants to the will of God. The authority over Abraham's descendants did not belong to God, but to Abraham who chose to give his descendants into the hand of God. Do you see the importance of that? But I know Abraham is rejoicing in heaven now because he made that choice. Throughout the Bible, we read of men and women who surrendered to the will of God and came into agreement with with God so so his will could be done on earth. We can follow the stories of faithful men and women such as Rahab, Ruth, David, and many others in the lineage of Jesus who came into agreement with God ultimately resulting in the birth of the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of God. Do you realize that? That it wasn't just Abraham, but now God, Abraham said, here are my descendants, you can use them. And then God then looked for a descendant of Abraham who would also agree, and that moved it on. And then he found another descendant of Abraham who also agreed, and it continued and continued and continued in that, till that line of a, a submission came to the birth of Jesus. That's amazing, isn't it? 
Prayer is the first and most important thing we can do to see the fulfillment of God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is the difference between seeing God's will done in our lives and failing to see the fulfillment of God's will done in our lives. It doesn't matter all the other things you do for God, but if you're not praying, you will not see the fulfillment of God's will in your life. The natural-minded person doesn't pray much because he sees little value in prayer and would rather be engaged in activities that appear to be more practical. You can even have naturally-minded people in ministry, and they're busy organizing outreach, they're busy organizing this and that. Those are all good things, but they don't pray because they think, oh, people get saved because we have outreach. No, people get saved firstly because you pray, and secondly because you have outreach. The carnally minded person does not continue in prayer because he quickly tires when he does not see immediate results. But the Bible exhorts us that by faith and patience we inherit the promises. Paul exhorts us, rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. See, some people pray, well, I prayed and nothing happened. But they prayed one time. See, the carnally minded man wants immediate results. Immediate results. The spiritually minded Christian sees the true value of prayer and is able to patiently wait on God in agreement whether it takes a few minutes or a few decades until the fulfillment of God's promises and purposes are manifest. I love the story of George Mueller. I think many of you have heard of George Mueller. He was... uh, He was a great man of faith. He was actually born in Prussia, but he moved to England in the 1800s. He was living during that time, and uh, he became a believer there and became a man of prayer. He had very little financial resources, but in ministry, all of a sudden, he had a heart for the orphans because in England at that time, nobody cared for the orphans. These kids just lived on the street almost like animals. Nobody to care for them, but he was stirred. And he began to pray. And through his prayers, he never ever did a fundraising. But he prayed. He prayed. He never asked people for money, but he prayed. And you know what God did through him? God raised up an orphanage where he fed, clothed, educated, and brought up 2,000 orphans at any given time. An orphanage that held 2,000 children He was a man of prayer. And I remember one story where he had prayed for the resources. And the Lord, when he first started, he started off small. Somebody provided him a building. He kept praying, provided him beds and clothing and everything he needed. He he prayed and he got the workers. And then he opened the doors of that orphanage that morning after all those months of prayer and preparation. And you know, he was shocked what happened not one child came in to that orphanage. And there were like th- hundreds of thousands of orphans in England, and not one came. And he thought, God, what has happened? And then he remembered. He had asked God for everything except one thing, orphans. <laughs> and he prayed, and the place was filled. The importance of prayer. We will look at two examples in the New Testament this morning who who surrendered to the will of God in prayer, impacted mankind, and resulted in advancing God's plan of salvation on the earth. The first example is the birth of John the Baptist. The birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner, who prepared the way for the Messiah, is a wonderful example of how persistence in prayer resulted in his kingdom coming and Jesus Christ being manifest. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. 
So they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. The story of the birth of John the Baptist commenced with the backdrop of his parents experiencing years of disappointment because Elizabeth was barren. The narrative in Luke chapter 1 introduces both Zacharias and Elizabeth as well advanced in years, emphasizing the impossibility for them to have a child at that time in their lives. It also reinforces their disappointment at being childless for so many years. However, in spite of all these disappointments, they did not allow this to jade their view of God, nor did it cause them to give up serving him faithfully. They were both righteous before God, walking in all his commandments and ordinances, and the Lord blameless. They did not give up on God. They did not allow the disappointments of life to distort their view of God, nor to question his faithfulness, although the prayers for a child seemed to go unanswered and possibly unheard. So you can picture this now. There is Zacharias and Elizabeth serving God faithfully, and they're barren, and they're praying for years for a child, and there is no answer. Now, how many people here say, I know people who've walked away from God because they haven't gotten what they felt they should have gotten? I know people specifically don't want to serve God because they don't have children. But there is Zacharias and Elizabeth, even though they've been praying and there is no answer to their prayers, they're not giving up on God. They're not questioning his faithfulness. They're saying, I'm going to continue to trust God. Their faithfulness to continue to serve God in spite of difficult and even painful circumstances reveals their true motivation was pure because they loved God and harbored no selfish reasons. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Sometimes in life, we may experience apparent setbacks or disappointing circumstances, even though we are seeking to walk with God and submit submit fully to his will. These experiences test the true motivation of our hearts, and provide us opportunities to increase our faith. God will use those very circumstances, which we we, we may regard as negative, to bring forth the glorious purposes of his will and his kingdom in our lives, if we're willing to persistently trust him and continue steadfastly in prayer. In other words, can we say, God, even though I'm praying and seeking you, and even though I do not yet see an answer to my prayers... Even if it's for decades, I will not give up on believing that you are good and faithful. When it says they were both righteous before God, it didn't mean that Zacharias and Elizabeth never sinned or that everything did was perfect. It meant they dealt with their sins in a godly way by walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Specifically, it meant going to God in faith and acknowledging and confessing their sins and failures and making the, oper- uh, making the appropriate sacrifices at the temple to atone for their sins and looking forward in hopeful expectation to the anointed one, the Messiah, who would come and fulfill all the righteous requirements of the law, resulting in the promised redemption. In other words, why were they righteous? Not because they never sinned, because we all sin, but because every time they recognized they had sinned, they went to the temple. They made the sacrifice. They acknowledged their sins. But in making the sacrifice, they also looked forward to the one who'd fulfill the sacrifice. Zacharias wholehearted devotion to God is also evident because at his age, he would have been exempt from serving at the temple. The priests were only required to serve at the temple from the ages of 25 to 50. However, if the priests and Levites wanted to, they could choose to continue to minister beyond the age of 50. 
Zacharias was one who chose to continue to serve God at the temp- serve at the temple, even though he was already advanced and aged. He went beyond the requirements of the law. He didn't just serve the temple because he was required to as a priest. Even when he was freed from that obligation, he chose to continue to minister at the temple as a priest to God. How many times do Christians give up on God when things don't go the way they would have wanted? But Zacharias and Elizabeth are two examples of believers who continue to persevere in prayer and service to God even in the face of great disappointments. Many times we're faced with disappointments and maybe great disappointments. And will we say, God, I choose still to serve you. I still choose to trust you. Their hopes for a child faded as old age overtook them. But their faithfulness in God and, and trust in God never faded. Verse 9 of Luke 1. According to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. We need to cultivate an atmosphere of expectation in our hearts because we don't know when God will suddenly invade our circumstances with a supernatural manifestation of his presence. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When our hearts are constantly filled with expectation because we know that God is always attentive to us, our prayers will be energized. Do you realize that? If you pray without knowing and believing that God is attentive to your prayers and he is going to invade your situation, whether it's at that moment or later, but he's going to, that will give energy to our prayers because, wow, God, you are hearing me and you are attentive I remember a number of years ago, there was a, a, a revival in a, Sarnia, uh, in a church in Sarnia, Pentecostal church, about maybe 10, 12 years ago. And I know the, um, the, the brother who was the assistant pastor at the time. And during that service, as they were just worshiping God, all of a sudden the pre- tangible presence of God came. And it filled the entire sanctuary with a mist. The presence of God. People's were, lives were transformed. People were being they were experiencing God in a very tangible way. They'd been praying for a long time for God to do something. And all of a sudden, one day, he showed up. I remember another time, and I think I've shared this before, but I remember, um, maybe I shared this, I'm not sure, maybe even recently, but I remember it was in, it was in 2003 or 2004. I re- recorded it. A friend of mine, he was coming to the church for a while, and and one Sunday morning, he, he, he got all excited during the worship, and he go, went around and began shaking everybody's hand and greeting everybody. And, of course, I was happy. If happy, people are happy, I'm happy. Let them shake hands. That's great, you know. Anyways, the next day, I was driving to the men's meeting, and I picked him up. And I was going to share um, in the men's meeting about angels, you know, just the, the Bible, what it teaches about angels. Anyways, as I'm driving there, he says to me, uh, he says, uh, Howard, uh, he says, you know, what happened yesterday morning in church? I go, well, you were happy. He goes, no, I, I was looking at the worship team, and behind the worship team were these three angels about 10 feet tall, and I saw them singing. And he's looking, and he takes his hands, and he covers his face and said, God, why are you showing me this? And he opens his eyes again, and they're still there. So he's so excited, he goes around and just shakes everybody's hands. He doesn't know what else to do. He can't even tell people what he's seeing. He's so overwhelmed. You know, when God shows up, when God shows up, and of course, uh, another time, Sylvia, uh, she has a story, she phoned me up. I, went, I was, this is about 2004. Anyways, I was, it was a Tuesday morning, and I was kind of praying, and I was saying, Lord, is this church going anywhere? And so, and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but Lord, is this church going anywhere? A few minutes later, Sylvia phones me up and says, I, I got to tell you what happened last night, I mean, Sunday night. And what happened is we, had a, we used to have a choir at our church, and then I began singing. But <clears throat> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and Martin says, that's no joke. 
That's why they keep me in the prayer room. So um, <laughs> anyways, and she said, well, you know, and after the choir practice, we went downstairs, we had a prayer meeting, and then the sanctuary is locked up. And so then um, uh, she, uh, during the prayer meeting, one lady had to leave, so you walked her out to the front foyer. This, we, this is before we had, this is when we had the sanctuary. And as she walked her out, they were hearing singing coming from the sanctuary, but it was locked up. There was no lights on. And, and Sylvia says to her, do you hear what I hear? And she goes, yeah. And so they went up to the door and tried to open the door, and they looked, and there was no lights on. And, and then a third lady heard it too, right? And there's a third lady going to the bathroom in the hallway, and she could hear the singing from, from the hallway in the sanctuary. And so Sylvia thought, wow, this is, that's amazing. But she goes, maybe the choir person came back and was playing some music or something. So she phoned her on the Tuesday, got a hold of her, and says, did you go back to the sanctuary after the choir practice? She goes, no, I went straight home. So there it was. I was saying, God, are you really doing something in this church? And she phones me up and tells me that story. And I go, I guess you are, Lord. <laughs> but the point is that God is on the move, whether we see it or not. He didn't let me hear it, but he let someone else to encourage me that God is hearing our prayers. And that will energize our prayer life. Verse 12. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. When God shows up, even in a fraction of his power and glory, it overwhelms us. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. And when people have a real encounter with God, it is overwhelming. It's like, you are real. It's not only seeing an angel or or seeing God supernaturally heal someone. It's much bigger than that. It's awakening that, wow, God is so, so real. Like we all believe in God as believers, but sometimes we don't believe as much as we should believe because we kind of become complacent to it. And when we have a supernatural encounter or, or even hear a testimony, it awakens us, wow. The angel's words brought both reassurance and surprise to Zacharias. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Zacharias found reassurance that God's favor was upon him. Zacharias was surprised that their prayers for a child were being answered at this late stage in their lives. Probably as a young man, married couple, Zacharias and Elizabeth, had prayed for many years for the Lord to give them a child. However, at the autumn of their lives, as the autumn of their lives began to overtake them, their hope and prayers for a child likely faded and eventually ceased long ago. It was like by the time people are having grandchildren, they're not even, they don't even have children, they stopped praying probably many years ago for a child. However, just because they stopped praying for a child didn't mean they had stopped praying or looking to God. Like most devoted Jews, they would have continued to pray and wait with expectation for the consolation of Israel, the Messiah, who would bring deliverance and usher in God's eternal kingdom. You know, when Zacharias would go and minister at the temple, what would he do? All those sacrifices were in preparation when God would bring the Messiah. And so they continue to look to God for the ultimate answer of the Messiah. In fact, the birth of John was not only the answer to their prayers for a child, but also the answer to their prayers for the Messiah because their son's ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. And he will turn away many of the children of Israel to the Lord he will turn many, uh, turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow. To have a son who answered both prayers. 
One, for having a child. And secondly, to be involved, have one who would actually usher in the, G- the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Rather than being filled with delight at this marvelous news, Zacharias' response was marred by a tinge of skepticism rooted in his years of disappointment. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Zacharias' question, How shall I know this? was not asking with wonderment, How is God going to do this? But skepticism, How can I really know this is going to happen? Now you've got to picture this. He sees this angel, he's going, wow, he's shaking. He's an angel, right? And then the angel says, you're going to have a son. Elizabeth's going to bear a son. And his response is, are you pulling my leg? Come, come, come on. Like, like he's saying this is an angel. He goes, are you pulling my leg? You're not just joshing, are you? Josh is not here. What, what an interesting response. See, he'd been jaded with disappointment. We can still walk with God faithfully, but we still can have hurts of disappointment in our hearts that are undealt with, which affect us. Sometimes as believers, we pray so long for a breakthrough that we lose hope and begin to think, can things really change? But God wants us to continue to look to him in prayer, believing that he is hearing us and he is at work behind the scenes and at the proper time and in the best way, he will answer us. In other words, no matter what you prayed for, no matter how many days or years or decades, don't give up saying, God, I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to pray. I'm not going to let disappointments to jade my faith. Zacharias and Elizabeth's prayers for a son were in agreement with God's will. They just didn't understand God's perfect timing. Timing is extremely important in God's plan. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth a son, born of a woman, born under the law. Although they had stopped praying for a son many years before, God had not forgotten their prayers, years of prayers, and now was preparing to answer even though they had stopped praying for a child, but they were still seeking God faithfully, and their prayers were now going to be answered. Isn't that amazing? They had stopped praying for a child because they go, we're really old now. You know, our pension plan can't even afford a child. But the thing was, even though they stopped praying for a child, they didn't give up on God. And guess what? Those prayers were heard and were answered at the right time. Verse 19, and the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was, pre- was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. Because Zacharias doubted the word of the Lord, the sign that was given to him was, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. If he had believed, he could have immediately proclaimed the word of the Lord. But because he doubted, he could not speak until the birth of his son. However, God used his muteness as a sign to the people that he had had a supernatural encounter with God. You know, he lost a wonderful opportunity. He could have heard the words believed that he could have come out of the holy place and said, an angel appeared before me and God has proclaimed that we will have a son. Elizabeth will bear a son in her old age and God will use her mightily. He could have had that wonderful opportunity. But because he doubted, he wasn't able to speak those words till after the birth of his son. So he lost that opportunity to make that proclamation. But even his muteness was a sign to the people that a miracle happened because he came out and he couldn't speak. And I could imagine Elizabeth says, this really is a miracle. My husband has stopped talking. (laughs) That's what my wife would have said. 
In other words, God still used it for a sign, but it would have been a much more glorious sign if he had come out and said, an angel appeared, and this is what is going to happen. But he didn't have that opportunity until after the birth of his son to step out in faith and proclaim the miracle before it happened. He had to state it after the fulfillment. In fact, I like that point. I'm going to write that down. Verse 21. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Elizabeth and Zacharias had to wait many years and endure much disappointment before the birth of John. However, the years of sorrow were not in vain. God had a very specific purpose that would be used in his plan of salvation. But what was God's reason for them to have a son in their old age rather uh, after, in, their, in their old age, after a lifetime of barrenness. So why did God specifically want that? Why couldn't they just have had him when they were just like everybody else? John the Baptist's ministry was like no other before because he was preparing the way for the Messiah. In fact, Jesus said this about himself. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist's. John the Baptist's ministry was unique in a number of ways, but chiefly in two ways. First, he was the one to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. And second, although he was the greatest Old Testament prophet, he did not perform one miracle, produce one sign, or heal one single person. He's called the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, the greatest But he did not one miracle. Moses divided the Red Sea. But John the Baptist didn't even drive a puddle. (laughs) Elijah raised from the dead. But John the Baptist didn't even cure a cold. Why was he called the greatest? He was called the greatest. Because all the other prophets pointed to the one who would come. They were pointing to the one. Even Isaiah, the great prophet Isaiah, was pointing to the one who had come. But John the Baptist was the one that's saying, he is here now. He is here now. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He is here now. That's why he's the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. He had the privilege of saying, he has arrived in the history of mankind. It is now fulfilled. The promise that all the other prophets had spoken about. So how did all of Israel know that John had a very special special message from God if he did not perform one miracle, sign, or wonder? I mean, how would they know then? I mean, there were no miracles. It was through John's miraculous conception and birth. If, if If Elizabeth's pregnancy was supernatural, what kind of child would she bear? And all those who heard heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Can you imagine this? If, if, if John the Baptist was born when, they were, when she was in her 20s, and then when his time came and he began to say, the Messiah is here, prepare the way for the Lord, they'd go, is this a nutcase? They'd go, why would they believe him? Why would they believe him? There was no miracles, there were no signs, there were no wonders. He would just be just one of a whole bunch of people making proclamations everywhere. They wouldn't have known But you know how they knew? See, Zacharias was a priest. And Elizabeth, his wife. And all of Israel would have known about her barrenness over years and years and years. And you know, like, everybody, even Jewish people, liked to gossip. And they would say, what's wrong with Zacharias and Elizabeth? Maybe there's some secret sin that God has not blessed them with a son. Maybe there's something not right in their life and all this, the wagging tongues, as they say. 
And so all of Israel would have known they got lots of publicity, free advertisement. And this went on for decades and decades and decades. And then finally, when she was old and they were beyond the possibility, all of a sudden this angel appears, Zacharias, and his, his wife conceives. And she bears a child, John. And at his birth, Zacharias writes his name over John and his tongue is released and he opens his mouth and he begins to prophesy. So what happens now? All Israel goes, what is with this child? And they're waiting. They're waiting five years and ten years and everybody's eyes are on this child as he grows up. They're waiting for him. He goes into the wilderness. They're waiting for him. 30 years go by. 30 years go by. They're waiting. What will he say? And when he begins to speak, all Israel rushes into the wilderness to hear the word they've been waiting for for 30 years. So you understand the importance of why they had to go through that time. All the eyes of Israel were fixed on John the Baptist from his birth, eagerly anticipating the day he would speak the message God had given him. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. And why was it that there were no miracles in his... Why couldn't God just have provided miracles? Do you know why? I, this is what I think. This is my opinion is that his message was so important that there was nothing else to distract from that message. All the other prophets, there were miracles and, and all these things, but the message he had was the greatest miracle, the greatest sign, the greatest wonder, that God's Son was incarnate in the flesh. That was the greatest message. And so there were no signs and wonders and miracles because that one message was the most powerful, important message of all mankind. And so there were no signs and wonders and miracles besides that to distract from the centrality of the message that John the Baptist had for Israel and for mankind. Zacharias and Elizabeth bore years of shame, sorrow, and disappointment so God's message could go forth. What a privilege! What a privilege! All those years of disappointments, when they saw the fruit of it, I'm 100% sure they would have said, Hallelujah. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to suffer those disappointments for your glory. That your kingdom could come. That the message could go forth. Because Zacharias and Elizabeth sacrificed because of Zacharias and Elizabeth's sacrifice, they were, they were blessed to not only observe to see his kingdom come, but, partic but participants in God's kingdom coming and his will being done on the earth as it is done in heaven. By them raising John the Baptist, they were participants in seeing God's kingdom come. And by their prayers. Sometimes prayer and intercession takes on the form of waiting on God patiently for his perfect timing. Only in God's timing is His will on earth. Uh, only in God's timing is His will done on earth as it is already done in heaven. I'm convinced that they were they went at the birth of John. They were no longer disappointed with their years of waiting. Verse 26 of John 1. Oh, sorry. Um, Mary provides the second example of agreeing with God in prayer. So we're going to look at one more example, Mary. Luke 1, 26. Now in the sixth month of the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, Consider what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, 
Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the, called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary was greeted by an angel with the most remarkable news that a woman ever heard. You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. What an amazing word. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? Mary had one simple question, how can this be since I do not know a man? Although Mary and Zacharias both responded to the words of the angel with questions, the difference, in their mo- the difference in their motivation for asking the question is striking. Zacharias's question was rooted in disbelief, while Mary's question was simply trying to understand what the Lord was saying to her and what was required of her. Mary asked the question out of an honest heart of faith, while Zacharias asked the question out of a heart of unbelief and disappointment. She basically said is, how can this happen and what am I supposed to do? Verse 35 and 36. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your, your relative, has also conceived this son in her old age. And this now is the sixth month for her who was called barren. The angel told Mary that it would not be a natural conception. It would be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit, and she would conceive a son who would be called the Son of God. Her cousin Elizabeth's miraculous conception in her old age was also a sign to Mary that the words spoken over her regarding the virgin birth of her son would also come to pass. One woman was too old and one was too young. But both agreed with the will of God, and he visited both of them with his power and his glory. And then verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. With God, nothing will be impossible. The angel's angel's words ended with a revelation that God's power is infinite, his plans are perfect, and his glory beyond comprehension. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary's response resounds with faith and a full and unreserved surrender to the will of God. Behold, the hand servant of the Lord, or the maid servant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Once Mary agreed to God's will being done in her life and specifically agreed for her body to be used for the glory of God, the angel departed from her. His job was done and hers was about to begin. Mary's agreement with the will of God, the last piece of the puzzle had been put in place to bring about the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. Do you realize that? That, that she needed to say yes. While in the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth, the role of prayer is is self-evident, one may ask, how does prayer play a role in the story of Mary? For it is clear she wasn't praying to have a supernatural conception or to give birth to the Son of God. So with Elizabeth and Zacharias, they were praying for a child. But for Mary, she wasn't praying, I want to have the Son of God. I want to have a supernatural conception. Mary's response to the angel is her prayer. Mary's response to the angel is her prayer. Behold, I made servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. God revealed his will for her life, uh, for her life to Mary, and her response was, yes, I agree with you, let your will be done in my life. Prayer is much more straightforward than many understand because it is simply speaking with God. Prayer should be a two-sided conversation. See, when the angel came and said, this is God's will for your life to conceive a son supernaturally who is the son of God, she then had a choice. She could have said yes, or she could have said no. If she said no, God would have had to find someone else. 
But she said, yes. She said, yes. And she said, let it be done according to your word. And so that was her prayer. That was prayer. She goes, yes, that is prayer. Do you get that? Yes, that is prayer. All you have to say is, yes, Lord, your will be done. That is prayer. That's where prayer is seen. Because sometimes, many times in my life, God has shown me what he wants me to do or what wants to happen. So I just start to pray and what it already knows. It's almost like cheating, isn't it? Because you know if you pray, what he's already shown you is going to happen. Sometimes we pray and we're not sure how it's supposed to happen or what, what really will happen. But other times he says, this is what I want to do. I said, okay, then I'll cheat and I'll pray according to your will. That's an easy way to do it, isn't it? To more fully appreciate Mary's response to the angel, it is important to understand the last words the angel spoke to her. For with God, nothing will be impossible. But the literal Greek words are this. For no word from God shall be void of power. That's actually what it says in the Greek. It says, for no word from God shall be void of power. Therefore, appreciating the flow in this conversation between the angel and Mary, the angel said, for no word from God shall be void of power. And Mary responded, let it be done according to your word. He says, no word from God will be void of power. So she says, then let it be done according to your word. Now, you know what's even more interesting about this? Even though the New Testament is written in the Greek, this entire conversation took place in Aramaic. But in the spirit, there was that revelation of what was going on. Through the birth of Jesus Christ, the word was made flesh. Mary's agreement with the will of God brought forth the living word of God. Being in agreement with God's word releases the power of God. Being in agreement with God releases the power of God. That's why I don't tire in praying. I don't tire in praying about the same things because when we're in agreement with the will of God, we're going to see God's will done. It releases the power of God in our lives and in the lives of those around us. That's why we can pray. I can pray for hours because I know God is hearing me and my prayers are releasing his will so I can come into agreement with God in prayer. Mary's word of agreement was what God was looking for. And once she said yes, the angel immediately departed. That was it. As soon as she said, let it be done according to your word, the angel was gone because she had made that agreement. She had given authority over to God and said, you can use my body, you can use my life. And at that moment, that's all she needed. God says, the last piece of the puzzle is in place. Now I can bring forth my son Jesus to be the savior of mankind. Luke 145, blessed is she who believed, for there will be fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord, because she believed it was going to be fulfilled. Because Mary was willing to believe and agree with God, then God was able to fulfill his plan of salvation. Isn't that amazing? Now get this. Through one woman's agreement with Satan, sin entered the world, and through one woman's agreement with God, the Savior entered the world. Do you see God's redemptive work? That the very thing that Satan used to bring destruction, which was by deceiving Eve, God comes to a woman and says, will you agree with me that I can reverse all the negative things that Eve did? So he chose another woman to reverse what Eve had done in her decision. I love God's plan of redemption. Both Elizabeth and Mary came into agreement with the will of God for their lives. Now, was it more difficult for Elizabeth or for Mary to come into agreement with the word of the Lord? For one was too old and one was too young. So what was more difficult for Elizabeth, who suffered all those years of disappointments, or for Mary? How many people think it was more difficult for Elizabeth to agree with God? Can you put your hand up? How many people think it was more difficult for Elizabeth? Uh, for Mary, for Mary, sorry. Okay, this is like most elections. Most people don't vote. So anyways, <laughs> um, we'll keep going to the next point now. So, <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Um, hi, um, even though Elizabeth had endured many years of disappointment, the promise of bearing a child would, would remove the shame and social stigma she felt. Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach from among the people. So in Elizabeth, even though it might have been hard to believe, but we're her to believe saying if she believed in God's promise, that means everybody would realize she was a righteous woman. There was no hidden sin. The reproach of what everybody looked upon her would be removed. So for her to say, yes, I agree with you that this miracle will happen and then people will realize she isn't that wicked woman or having some kind of hidden sin or something or having not enough faith. However, for Mary, as an unwed mother, woman, to agree with the word of the Lord for her life meant she would be misunderstood, reproached, and possibly forsaken by her family and even put to death. The promise given to Elizabeth would remove her reproach. The promise given to Mary would bring her reproach. Do you realize that? Like you say, well, but everybody knows it was a miracle. Well, just, get, just picture this. A young, unwed mom, a young unwed woman comes into the church, pregnant, four months pregnant, and, and, and people say, what happened? Well, I met this angel, and it was a miracle. We would say, he was no angel, and that was no miracle. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? Nobody would say, well, maybe this time an angel showed up. Nobody would think that. So when she has now conceived this child, she knew that when she said, let it be done according to your will, she said, let the reproach or whatever else happens because I will submit myself to the will of God. In other words, there are times that we will agree with God's will and we will be misunderstood, we will be rejected, it will cost us something. And she was willing to take all that social stigma, even the possibility of being stoned to death. But she said, let your will be done. Her response is similar to Esther when she went before the king and said, if I die, I die. But better die, better to die doing the will of God than to die not doing the will of God. Often when we choose to to surrender to the will of God, we will be misunderstood by family and friends and even by this world. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Do you know something? It's becoming more and more evident that Christianity is seen as a very evil thing in many people's eyes and even in nations. When we hear the words of Mary, they resound with great, great faith and love and the love she had for God. Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now we can really understand what she said. She said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary's response was, Here I am. Do with me what is pleasing in your sight. God entered history as a son of man through Mary's sacrifice of agreement. God entered the history as a son of man through Mary's sacrifice of agreement. In Luke 1.48, For he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. The Catholics have almost deified Mary, and the Protestants have almost ignored her. But in reality, she is an example of a woman of great faith and was, who was fully submitted to the will of God. The story of Elizabeth and Mary, from the, with the story of Elizabeth and Mary, we can learn a number of things. First, it is essential to agree with God's will if we want to see God's will done in our lives. If you're not going to agree with God's will in our lives, it's not going to happen. Number two, second, God does, what God does in our lives will impact people beyond ourselves to those around us and even the other nations. When, when you, whoever you are, if you're a believer and you choose to submit to God in prayer, you're, not only will God impact you, but he'll impact people around you. He'll impact nations. Even if just through prayer, God, God will impact nations even through your prayers. And as I said before, there's Muslims, hundreds of thousands of Muslims receiving visions and dreams of Jesus who have never heard the gospel and receiving Christ. Why is that happening now? Because Christians are praying and God is, 
They're having encounters with Jesus supernaturally. Third, initially things may not work out the way we would expect or like. When we start to seek God, don't think that, well, everything's going to go easy now. You'll be times of disappointments or opposition, but those are all things meant to bring things into line with his perfect way. Fourth, the timing is in God's hands, not ours. Some things will happen immediately, and others may take decades. And fifth, the ultimate outcome is far more wonderful and glorious than we could have hoped for or even imagined. If you, as believers, everyone is a believer, if you will really say, God, I'm going to start to submit to you, I'm going to start to agree with you. When I'm struggling, I'm going to turn to you. When I sin, I'm going to confess my sins. And if you will agree, you will see at the end of your life that you're, you're going to be more joyful than you could ever imagine because you'll see God. I remember one man I know, he told me that he knew this very, very uh, uh, successful lawyer who was a Christian. And he went to church. He was involved in many Christian works even. But his own personal prayer life and his personal devotion with God was, was weak. But he was very successful. So it really looked like he was really successful, even successful in, in helping out different things. But on his deathbed, he was weeping. And he said, and he, he, and he said to his friend, see all these things I've... He had not only all the wealth that he attained, but he had all these accolades and awards and stuff for all the things he had done. But realizing that he really not dedicated his life in prayer the way he needed to. He had really not just surrendered his will, his life to God the way he should have. He wasn't like walking in terrible sin, but he just had never read, said, God, you do with your with my, what you want to. You do with my, my life the way you want to. Versus, God, this is how I, I want my life to be, and, and when it intersects your will, that's great. But this is, I want to be successful. I want to do this. I want to do that. And at the, at the end of his life, he wept, and he said, I'd give all this up if I could have just completely surrendered my will to God. But we have this opportunity. And so I want to encourage each one of you to, to develop that time in prayer, just to learn. Even if you're starting off at five or ten minutes a day, that's good. Just start to do that and let it grow until you start to really enjoy being in God's presence, where you really enjoy knowing God in an intimate way. Because the, the, the greatest barometer of our spiritual life is how much we pray. You know, just to be learning to abide in enjoying his presence and agreeing with his will. It's not about works. It's like saying, God, I remember for many years, I, my prayer life was about five minutes a day on, on, on good days. But 23 years ago, I had an encounter with God. I just chose, I'm going to start to seek you. And after 17 years of struggling with prayer, he began to teach me how to enjoy just loving him and agreeing with him. So if he can do it in my life, he can do it in anybody's life. He can do it in anybody's life. Hallelujah. We're going to have one more song now. And, uh, and then we're going to, after we have this one more song, we're going to have an opportunity for the prayer teams to come forward. And, but let's just uh, turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your faithfulness, Father. Lord, I thank you so much for your love. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray there'd be no condemnation. Nobody would feel defeated or feel uh, ashamed, Lord. I pray, Father, that they would realize that we just need to come to you and say, God, I, I don't even know how to pray. Father, but you're the one who teaches us how to enjoy prayer. We can't do it on our own, but we can do it by your anointing. We can come to you and say, God, make me a person who enjoys prayer. Make me a person who knows how to come before you and spend time in your presence. Lord, we can't do it on our own. It's not by our strength that we become those prayer warriors. But it's by our willingness to say yes to you. It's by our willingness to say yes, make me one who knows how to pray, who knows how to spend time in your presence, who knows how to agree with your will, to see your will done on earth, even as it is done in heaven. 
Yes, Father, make it so, Lord. Yes, Father, we just come to you and say, Lord, we just say, take my life and do with my life as you would want, Lord. I don't even know exactly what you want, but Lord, your ways are perfect, Father. And we say yes, even as Mary said yes, even as Elizabeth said yes, we say yes, take our lives and use it for your glory that many would come to Christ, many lives would be touched, many nations would be moved. Oh God, use us as those living sacrifices, Father, for your son Jesus by the power and the glory of your Holy Spirit Lord thank you Father thank you Lord hallelujah